Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining us today uh, for our fourth uh, webinar series for this spring. My name is Jason Warner, Extension Cow-Calf Specialist here in the Department of Animal Sciences and Industry at Kansas State University. And so this is our fourth of a series of four webinar series uh, that we've, we've put together really with the idea of, of being able to provide some good usable information uh, for our producers, uh, not only here across the state of Kansas, but as well in other areas as, as well too. When we think about uh, some challenges that we've certainly seen here over the last uh, uh, several months uh, going into the start of this growing season as it relates to, to drought and forage management considerations and those kinds of things. And, and certainly we're very, very appreciative and blessed with the moisture that we've received here over the last three to four weeks. But we know that in a lot of areas around the state, uh, we're going to continue to need that moisture as we go throughout the, the rest of the season for adequate forage production to occur. And, and as we were putting this together, we felt that these topics that we've had on this webinar series are, are important uh, as, as we think about conditions that may arise later uh, throughout the season and, and for folks to be able to make decisions. And so uh, this, this topic that we have for today on feeding and management of early wean calves is, is one that we think is, is very important. And, uh, and for this topic, uh, we have uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Justin Wagner at the Southwest Research and Extension Center in Garden City is, uh, is going to uh, visit with us about some strategies and, and some things to keep in mind when we think about uh, early weaning calves. And just as a reminder for everyone uh, for today, if you have questions, uh, feel free to use the uh, Q&A uh, box uh, where you can enter those questions there. And, and so we'll have some time uh, to be able to come back and address those. And, and, uh, and have some time for discussion as, as well too. Uh, just to remind everyone uh, that uh, all of these webinars, the, uh, this one as well as the, the first three that we have recorded here over the last uh, four weeks are posted on our, our extension website, ksubeef.org. So if you go to that website to the main landing page and then just scroll down, uh, the recordings uh, uh, are all there available that you can go back and, and look at at any time. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Justin Wagner, and, and uh, we'll begin. Thanks again for joining us. So thank you, Jason. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with everyone here uh, this morning about this topic of uh, feeding and management of early wean calves. Um, I always uh, enjoy visiting about, uh, you know, whether it's early wean calves or conventional wean calves with producers, because I think it's one of the the really important segments of the beef industry, especially as we think about preparing these calves uh, to uh, to go on to the next segment of the, of the beef industry, and and just if we can set them up for success as as they go on into that next segment. And so as we as we think about the you know the life of a calf and and what they're going to go through, that you know obviously maternal separation, acclimation to a new environment, and and really adjusting to those things is is going to be one of the more maybe traumatic events in that calves life and so um, you know learning about how we can to minimize those those impacts and uh, and uh, hopefully set that calf up for success later on I think is a is a really important topic for us uh, so I hmm. well Jason it uh, looks like my See if we can get this to advance. There we go. Took just a minute to click in the, the right space there. So where I want to start today is I think it's really important for us to, to maybe define what we would traditionally think of as early weaning, maybe, and then conventional weaning. And so, you know, the, the most common definition of early weaning for calves is, is weaning calves at, at less than 180 days of age. And so if we think of conventional weaning on a calf being 100 to 220 days of age, uh, obviously, earlier or earlier than normal weaning, as I like to put it, would be anything less than that. Uh, oftentimes, we we get the question of, well, how early can I wean a calf? And you know, in the research literature that's out there, uh, we can implement and wean a calf as early as 45 days of age. In terms of you know uh, the ability to uh, to utilize dry feed stuffs and acclimate acclimate to those environments. Uh, we really have a fully functional rumen if that calf has been a, exposed through a normal production scenario as, as early as, as 45 days of age. And so, so we can certainly implement that early weaning practice uh, very early on in that calf's life. I think from a practical application standpoint, 
we'd really like to get those calves to be 100 to 150 days of age. And if you think of, you know, a calf that's 100 days of age and we think about a normal calving distribution, we're likely going to have some calves in there that are going to be a, a little bit younger uh, than the 100 days or 150 days of age in there. So that's always something to keep in mind is uh, the age of those calves relative to that calving distribution and the age of the youngest calf that we uh, might be weaning within a particular group. So, but um, you typically the target that I like to work with producers is about 120 days of age is an age where it seems to work well from both uh, a performance standpoint on the calves as well as the health standpoint that we we see in those calves as well. So let's kind of begin with the why here. And so why might we want to implement an early weaning program? And, and one of the reasons that we certainly might want to consider this would be the effect of just simply removing that calf from the pasture on uh, the grazing pressure that we're placing on it. And so going back to some, some fairly uh, you know, historic data now that was conducted by Don Boggs at, at K-State in the, in, the, in the early 80s, uh, this, this slide here shows the dry matter forage intake of, of calves that were born in March uh, all the way out to August and September. And as you can see, as that calf increases in age, uh, their ability to consume forage from that pasture goes up. To, to by the time that they're in the, in the months of August and September, uh, where we're out there 150, 180 days of age, that those calves are gonna be consuming somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.7 to 2.2% of their body weight. And so if we extrapolate that out, we use a 450 pound calf, uh, that's 120 days of age. That calf is going to be consuming uh, just a little under six pounds of dry forage per day. And so that over time can certainly add up uh, in terms of the days. If we take uh, a lactating beef cow uh, and the forage that she is estimated to consume, that's going to be around 30 pounds per day. If we remove that calf and now she's a dry cow, that's going to be around 27 pounds. So not only do we see that reduction in the forage intake uh, from the calf, but also we do get a small reduction in terms of just removing that calf on the cow side of things as well. And so if we look at a, you know, kind of run this out a little ways for every four days that a calf is weaned, we essentially get one grazing day back on the cow. Uh, if we implement and wean 30 days early, we have the potential to gain about a week of additional grazing on the cow. And so if we think of a, a traditional drought scenario, obviously we do get some additional grazing days back on the pasture uh, just by implementing uh, that early weaning uh, protocol or practice here. The other aspect of early weaning um, that we've kind of alluded to here is once we remove the calf, obviously we take a cow that is, it was lactating and now she's a dry cow. And if we think about the energetics of, of doing that in terms of how that impacts that particular cow's energy requirements. And as you can see here in this, in this diagram, Maintenance energy requirements are going to remain relatively constant. You can see the impacts of both pregnancy as well as lactation here. And if you follow my cursor, one of the things you'll see here is if we're out here in these later stages uh, with lactation, and obviously as we remove that calf, we reduce uh, that energy demand associated with lactation. And so depending on the lactation potential of that cow, uh, we can easily reduce the energy requirements of that cow by 25 to 30 percent. And so not only do we see that forage uh, reduction in forage intake, but we're also reducing the amount of maintenance energy that's going to be required by those cows. And so really where we begin to see that the benefits of that is in cow body condition score. And so during my time at, at K-State, I've had the opportunity with uh, working with Casey Olson, as well as Dr. John Yeager at the Hayes Experiment Station, uh, to be involved in a number of different studies. Uh, some of them were centered around evaluating preconditioning programs and more specifically precondition, preconditioning duration. Uh, but they also set up very nicely to look at scenarios where we wean calves at different ages from 100 to 160 days of age. And so uh, some of the data from one of these studies is presented here, and you can see this is a body condition score of cows. Uh, we have different lengths of weaning periods, so there's the different ages of the calf here from 100 uh, to 160 days of age uh, in this study. But one of the things that I want to draw your attention to is the change in body condition score of these cows. So as we wean these calves and remove that lactation, that allowed those cows to pick up and increase their body condition score by somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a percent in a 30 to 60 day 
uh, period there. So, so we see that increase in body condition score for those cows uh, very rapidly, even if we're in that late summer uh, time period where those cows would still be grazing uh, native forages as well. So we see that, that increase in body condition score. And really kind of fast forward to another study here. Um, this was actually a study that looked at the frequency of dried distillers grain supplementation to cows. And this was a multi-year study. Uh, so essentially in year one, uh, we were forced to implement an, <clears throat> excuse me, an early weaning protocol in which these calves were weaned at 113 days of age in, in year one. And so we have body condition scores of the cows uh, at calving in year one and year two, and we would have implemented the early weaning. So between these two, two benchmarks here. And so what I want to illustrate here is that our cows at calving after in the spring, after we had implemented that early weaning protocol, uh, we were actually picked up around a half a condition score in those cows in that subsequent calving. And so those cows, so we see that these cows are going to, when we early wean, we're going to pick up some body condition, typically very early on uh, post weaning. And then it can be very easy for us to maintain that increase in cow condition all the way out to that subsequent uh, next calving season, which allows those calves, those cows to calve in a better body condition score. So you know, as we think about one of the real, you know, maybe understated aspects of early weaning is that it's really about the cow. It's about improving that condition on the cow and, and really managing uh, those cow nutrient requirements. And so, yes, we, we do tend to focus on the, the calf side of things, but more importantly, it's about improving the cow condition and a, and a means for us to manage those, those cow requirements. So we've discussed the why, we've discussed some of the benefits in terms of the, uh, the condition on the cows. So now let's discuss just a little bit about how we should maybe think about managing uh, these, these lighter weight calves. And so, you know, one of the things that I often point out in any type of feeding scenario with, with cattle, dry matter intake is, is one of the most important things that we have to manage. It, it's imperative to success. And really one of the challenges that I think we run into uh, with newly weaned calves is that we often don't think about uh, how low those intakes will, will be. And so oftentimes uh, newly weaned calves will only consume one to one and a half percent of their body weight per day in, in dry feed. And so we have a very low dry matter intake. And so if we think about newly weaned calves uh, that could range in weights from 350 to 500 pounds, and if we uh, at one to one and a half percent of body weight on a 400 pound calf, we're really only talking about an animal that's going to consume somewhere between four and six pounds of dry feed per day when in the first few days following that the implementation of weaning and maternal separation. Now, if we think more on the scale of, well, what is the maximum intake that these calves might consume? Uh, even if we're out here at, in the territory of two and a half percent of body weight, uh, we're really only talking about um, dry matter intakes in total that would range somewhere between seven uh, to 10 pounds of dry feed per day. So one of the things that we really have to keep in, in mind when managing these lighter weight calves is that they, they really don't consume a, a tremendous amount of feed. And so that does mean that, that we're going to have to change some of the things uh, in terms of our diet. Uh, and, and just making sure that we have adequate nutrient density to achieve some of those performance goals uh, that we would have for those calves. So focusing on some additional work that we've done at K-State, and this actually came from a PhD student's uh, dissertation. And this graph would depict the number of calves that we observed at the bunk during feedlot receiving, in which those calves had been exposed to different um, scenarios during the preconditioning uh, phase post weaning. And so the green line would depict calves at feedlot receiving that had been preconditioned and, and weaned in a dry lot environment. Uh, then this blue line would depict calves that would were weaned and, and preconditioned in a pasture environment that were provided a supplement. And then we have the red line, which was calves that were simply just maintained and weaned in a pasture environment with no additional feed or supplementation required. And so what you can see here is that the number of calves that are observed at the feed bunk, okay? So this is following one pass of the feed truck within the feedlot. 
is that those calves that had been weaned in a dry lot environment, there was a greater percentage of those calves that we observed at the bunk uh, per pen than those that had been maintained in either the pasture with a supplement or just the pasture protocol alone. Now, if you look at the pasture plus supplement treatment or this blue line, there's also a fair number of those calves as well that, that we're also seeing coming to the bunk. And so, you know, anytime we think about a weaning protocol, whether it's an early weaning or a conventional weaning scenario, one of the things that I like to use this data to illustrate is that previous exposure or experience matters to these calves. If we can expose them to a dry lot or we can expose them to a feed bunk, and more importantly, if we can get them to consume some type of dry feed or supplement, even if it's not similar to what they're going to be exposed to in that feedlot or those receiving protocols, it's going to have some benefit to those calves. You know, if we think about managing dry matter intake, one of the first steps that we have to do is actually get those calves to where they're going to come to the bunk. And so previous experience in terms of what we can do to those calves while they're with their dams on the pasture uh, certainly can have an influence as we bring those calves into the dry lot or look at implementing that weaning protocol. So oftentimes what I like to say is if you have the opportunity to take whatever the diet that you're going to utilize in your weaning program, and you can deliver that to the cows and calves uh, while they may be on pasture, uh, maybe as infrequently as just one to two to one to two times prior to bringing those calves into the pens and weaning them. Uh, that can be a very easy way to set those calves up for success uh, once they do get into those pens uh, following uh, weaning and removal from their dams. So I want to also discuss a little bit about the particular diet characteristics. We've talked about how the intake of calves is often going to be very low, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of one to one and a half percent of their body weight in the initial first few days after weaning. And so because those intakes are, are fairly low, uh, we need to keep in mind that the nutrient density of our ration needs to be fairly high, uh, especially because those intakes are going to be low. And if we typically, we'd like to see these calves gain somewhere in the neighborhood of, of two pounds of gain per day uh, at a 2% of body weight intake, which would really be our target somewhere around day five to seven once they've come on feed. I think one of the challenges with, with weaning calves is that some of the feeds that they're often most familiar with uh, and they would readily eat like a, a high quality grass hay are not necessarily very nutrient dense. So even if those calves were to consume and uh, maximize their intake out on something like a grass hay, um, we certainly wouldn't come near meeting their nutrient requirements that they would need to gain two pounds uh, per day each day that they're in those pens. And so we're going to have to increase the energy density of that diet to, to certainly offset that. And that often means we're going to have to utilize some form of a concentrate feed uh, to, to achieve those goals. Uh, the other thing that can be a challenge with newly weaned calves is that they may not readily consume feeds that they haven't been exposed to. And, and the one we commonly talk about is, well, silage. Obviously calves you know, may or may not have ever seen silage before. Uh, and that can be the case in some operations, and that's certainly a challenge. But we also have to keep in mind that we do have some availability of certain wet byproducts. And although most of those products are, are very, very palatable, in some cases, if that ration, that is a new feedstuff for some of those, those calves. And so I have seen challenges with producers where we had a fairly high byproduct inclusion in the ration, where we did see some challenges in terms of getting those calves to consume them, consume those products. So it's always just a good idea to, you know, give that some additional consideration. And if we do want to utilize uh, those type of feedstuffs, I think it's very important that we try to expose those calves to those feedstuffs prior to that weaning event. Uh, have had success with producers that tend to use uh, quite a bit of silage in their rations. Uh, if those calves have been exposed to silage while they were with their, their dams, oftentimes those calves will consume feed uh, very well once they come into the feed. So once again, kind of iterating that point that previous exposure to these novel feedstuffs can certainly go a long ways in terms of getting those uh, calves up on feed. So it's also important for palatability. Uh, as we think about, we certainly wanna put a ration in front of these calves that they're going to, to want to consume. 
if we think about kind of our ideal ration, uh, keeping in mind that we can certainly get a ration that can become too wet in some instances, which can make it a challenge for those calves to consume uh, enough dry matter to meet their requirements. And so, you know, the guidelines that I often give producers is that we'd like to have a moisture content of somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. Uh, that keeps the ration fairly palatable, it mixes well, uh, which really leads to the next point here is that, you know, calves, regardless of whether they're newly weaned or newly arrived calves in a feedlot, that typically stressed calves will tend to sort diet ingredients more so um, than other animals that have been up on feed. And in fact, there's some, some work from the 1980s that was conducted at New Mexico State at the uh, Clayton Livestock Research Center, where they actually observed that highly stressed cattle were more likely to consume concentrates and sort them out of a feed ration than the roughages. And so one of the things we have to keep in mind, especially with lightweight calves that do have a tendency to sort diet ingredients, is that we need to make sure that our rations are, are getting adequately mixed. Um, and so particle size and ingredient aggregation and how all those things are coming together uh, certainly can play a role. Uh, and so I think that's one of the reasons we also see some popularity and many producers will also will often use uh, some sort of a pelleted starter uh, type product on calves and, and those can work work quite well and and really kind of alleviate some of these products where we can get a, a fairly uh, high quality uh, diet in front of those calves uh, but at the same time once again uh, taking some st additional steps to make sure that those calves can be acclimated uh, to those those diet ingredients. So we've conducted a, a number of these preconditioning studies um, with Dr. Olson and, and Dr. Yeager. And, and just like with many research protocols, we, we try to standardize uh, what we're doing so that we can make direct comparison across different studies. And so in, in working with these studies over a number of years, uh, we essentially developed a little bit of a, a feeding and management program that we use on, uh, you know, new essentially all newly weaned calves, regardless of whether they're an early wean scenario or conventional aid calf. And we also use a similar protocol just for feedlot receiving. And, and it's always worked uh, fairly well for us, especially on, on highly stressed calves. And so this is essentially a, a seven day program that looks at the first week of these calves being on feed. And if we keep in mind that the intakes are going to be somewhere between you know one to one, and a half percent of body weight. Here we're working with the total dry matter intake of, of 1% of body weight on a dry matter basis. And so our goal with this program is to keep these calves fairly aggressive. Um, and so in essence, this is a program where we're going to limit feed these calves. And we're, we're really gonna implement kind of the, the age old saying, we're gonna go slow at first to go fast later. And so I think oftentimes it can be very easy to get ahead of calves at the bunk. Uh, in a feedlot or receiving situation or in a weaning situation. And so really what we're trying to do with this protocol is really kind of even out that first week of the feeding and, and try to, to really transition these calves fairly slowly at first, uh, keeping those calves to where they're enticed to come to the bunk, uh, which is good for us in that it can make oftentimes the detection of sick calves or ones that we may need to pull uh, much easier because they're at the back of the pen and, and they're not... Uh, uh, wanting to come to the bunk. So with this particular protocol, if we have a weaning diet or, or some sort of a starter uh, diet that we're, we're going to feed, typically that's going to be fairly high in concentrate. So we're going to deliver that at about a target rate of a half a percent of body weight. And then we also are going to provide those calves with a half percent of their body weight of a really high quality grass hay, uh, something that those calves are going to be fairly familiar with. Uh, and so we're hopefully going to use that to entice those calves to come to the bunk. And so what we do in this protocol is we put the, that diet or that uh, uh, starter pellet in the, in the bottom of the feed bunk, and then we top dress uh, that diet with the hay on top. And with the thought being that those calves are going to be drawn to the bunk by the hay, uh, and then eat through that hay to get to that ration at the, uh, the bottom of the bunk. On day two, we increase the amount of our starter ration uh, to 0.7% of body weight. We leave the amount of hay the same. Uh, once again, we put the diet on the bottom and the hay on the top. Uh, by day three, we are increasing that up to 0.9. The hay remains constant. We leave the diet on the bottom, the hay on top, 
And then at about day four or five, depending on the performance of the calves, we'll begin to switch that up. We still continue to increase the, the amount of concentrate or ration that we're delivering, uh, but we're going to put the hay on the bottom and the diet on the top for the remainder of this. And so as you follow the steps of this protocol, essentially what it's going to do is by day seven to 10, if we continue to increase the amount of diet or the concentrate that we're providing, um, we should achieve a target of being somewhere in that neighborhood of that two to 2.2 percent of body weight by day uh, 10 uh, that those calves have been on feed. And so we've removed the hay around day seven. And a lot of times I'll give managers the discretion to either increase those feeding amounts a bit uh, once we get beyond day five. Uh, typically I like to leave those, those calves fairly consistent in that in those early stages, uh, simply as we were, were trying to limit feed those calves a little bit, keep them fairly aggressive and essentially avoiding uh, some of the, the issues that can be caused by inconsistent intakes, uh, which can make it a challenge to get those calves up on feed. And so this protocol has worked very well for us um, in the studies that, that uh, we've conducted there and, and um, in, in a number of different scenarios. And so uh, it does you know, kind of serve that purpose of trying to move those calves up on feed within that first uh, two week period that they would be into the, the weaning pens or, or into the the, uh, the feedlot, if you will. So the other thing we need to keep in mind is the weaning pen and, and what that environment is. And, and for anyone that's, that's experienced some, some newly weaned calves, often one of the behaviors that we'll see them exhibit is they'll begin to walk the pen, right? And so uh, one of the things we can do uh, if we have the ability in some scenarios is to, to consider putting things in the path of those calves. Uh, if it's a fairly large pen, uh, placing an additional water tank or even an additional feed bunk in ter terms of that uh, pen environment for those calves to, uh, to run into as, as they exhibit kind of that behavior that, that we would expect them to do in terms of walking that pen uh, can be a way to, to get those calves up on feed, especially if it's a scenario where we know there's going to be some additional stressors that can be imposed. Now, obviously, you know, modifying this environment may not be something that's that's going to be possible in every scenario, uh, but it is something that uh, can be done to to help those calves certainly adjust to to that new environment and those those new feedstuffs as well. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, if we think about our our weaning facilities and a typical feedlot pen. Uh, you know, they're typically designed for much larger animals, right? And in some cases, we may be weaning calves into to very large dry lot scenarios or even larger gas, grass traps uh, where we've put in some portable feed bunks. And so in some of these pen scenarios, one of the things we can easily do uh, is to avoid those calves from laying in the back of the pen is to simply take some panels and reduce the size of that pen. Uh, and then once those cattle have become acclimated to the pen, we can pull those panels out of the way and, and get along a little bit better there. Uh, I often feel like this is one of the things we can do. It also reduces dust because our pen density a lot of times is increased there as well. Uh, so there can be some advantages to reducing the size of that pen. Uh, I've also had success where grass traps were used that were fairly large. Uh, we've actually, in some cases, uh, sent uh, cowboys out on horseback to essentially bring those calves in closer to those uh, feed bunks each morning prior to feeding. Uh, and that's also worked well with success. And really, the, if you think about that, really what we're trying to do is, is just keep those calves as close as we can to those feed bunks so that we're we're really trying to, to drive dry matter consumption with those calves as, as they come into feed. So, you know, giving some additional consideration uh, to that environment and how we might modify that just to make it a little easier for us in terms of the management of these lightweight newly weaned calves. Some other considerations or things to think about here in terms of the environment. So if we think about uh, calves and some of the behaviors that can be exhibited, uh, really what we'd like to do is, is pen those calves based on body size. If we can tighten those, uh, the weight range within the calves in the pen up a bit, uh, oftentimes that's easier to manage those calves. Uh, if we can limit that weight range to around plus or minus 50 pounds, 
uh, that's that's just a good benchmark. Oftentimes to achieve that, if we have adequate pen space, just a simple sort between steers and heifers uh, can be an easy way to do that. In terms of linear bunk space, uh, I would recommend at least 12 inches per calf. Uh, really, we can go higher. I certainly wouldn't recommend going less than that. Some other things that we also need to consider in terms of our pen environment is the height of the feed bunk as well as the water trough height. Uh, and certainly this typically when we wean larger calves or if it's a, a more of a, a feedlot type facility, that's not something we give some consideration to. But if you think about the, the, the height of a bunk or the bunk pad, and then if we have any type of holes or you know, oftentimes we get areas where we need to do a little bit of pen maintenance, uh, especially around the water tank. That can make it a challenge for some of these smaller calves to, to get up and, and access the, uh, the water. Uh, another factor here is dust. Uh, if we think about the health of those calves, especially if they're, it's a spring herd and we're weaning in August or September, uh, typically the weather is, is oftentimes dry in Kansas. Um, and so, if we can get in and, and clean those pens prior to those calves coming in those, those pens and, and really try to, to set ourselves up for success. Uh, oftentimes the topic of shade comes up and so we do need to consider airflow, especially if we're going to be weaning in these late summer months. Uh, if we're going to provide shade, I'd recommend that we certainly, you know, make sure we provide adequate shade. Because uh, if we just have a, a small amount of shade, uh, we know those cows are and those calves are going to crowd underneath that shade. And so having plenty of shade, if we're going to provide shade, is is fairly important. Uh, it's a little tougher to to get into, you know, kind of what's the recommended amount here, but uh, for calves of this weight. But certainly keep that in mind that airflow is an important consideration uh, in a lot of these these pens we're going to be weaning into. Uh, especially if we're in those late summer months where it can certainly get very warm for those calves. So as we we kind of wrap up here, uh, trying to keep our, our webinar series a bit short um, in, in terms of duration here, but, you know, we've conducted a number of studies with the focus of, you know, preconditioning duration uh, and a variety of aspects of, of weaning calves of at different ages and looking at the performance of those calves. And so if we think about the seven studies uh, from K-State, you know, in terms of some take homes, the performance that we've observed of our early wean calves really has been on par with our conventional wean calves. We really haven't seen um, any detriment in, in the studies that uh, we've conducted here at K-State in terms of those early wean calves. We've always had acceptable levels of performance. One of the other concerns that often comes up as well, you know, are these lighter weight calves that are early weaned, you know, obviously, you know, they, they certainly have an increased health with, risk and, and we just haven't seen that. Uh, typically our health risk in terms of our pulls and morbidity rates have, have always been um, relatively similar. Uh, the highest treatment rate or morbidity rate that, that I've seen in those studies is around 6.7. Uh, typically, those early wean calves, if we can achieve those intake objectives, are, are very healthy uh, for us. And, you know, I think a big part of that would be the cow herd uh, health program that goes into those calves. So, you know, once again, the common theme being here, try to set those calves up for success. And the other, you know, aspect here is we think about an early wean calf versus a conventional wean calf. I would actually argue that there's really not too much difference between an early wean calf and a conventional wean calf, that all newly wean calves, regardless of age, require some degree of management. And so what's likely more important for me is that if we're anytime we wean calves is that we have a management plan, uh, both in terms of how we're going to feed those calves uh, and also have a plan in place for our health protocols. You know, it's much, much easier if we know what we're going to treat those calves with, what products we're going to use, uh, what is our first line of treatment, what is going to be our second line of treatment, and could really, you know, having some discussions ahead of time with our veterinarian to, to maybe work out those protocols and, and have a plan in place uh, before we start can be a much better approach than, than trying to, uh, you know, work it out as you go if you do have a scenario where you are having some health issues with a set of calves. 
So really the last take home point that I, I want to leave everyone with is that I think a lot of times early weaning tends to be a strategy that focuses a lot around drought mitigation and drought management. I would actually argue that early weaning is really a management strategy that, that could in, uh, and should be used to improve cow condition with minimal impacts on calf performance. And so there's any time that we have a situation in which we'd like to put some additional condition back on our cows prior to coming uh, into the prior to weaning uh, during the grazing or, if, or even if it's on a particular set of fall cows, maybe in their drought conditions. Anytime we need to improve cow condition and we have lactating cows, uh, we have an opportunity to certainly utilize early weaning as a means of reducing those cows energy requirements um, and and hopefully put some additional condition back on on those cows. Another potential application for early weaning that I think often gets overlooked a bit is the young cows in a herd. Often following the, the first calf, uh, we know it can be a challenge for those young females to to maintain their body condition just because of some of the challenges of they're still a growing animal uh, with a lactating calf at side. And especially if we run into any environmental challenges uh, within a year, it can certainly be a challenge for those younger females uh, in the herd. And so early weaning can certainly uh, be a means to, to help those younger females along in the herd and, and hopefully we can retain them uh, on down the road. And so with that, uh, I'll share my contact information here if you have additional questions or just need any assistance, I would encourage you to reach out to any of the members of our KSU Beef team. Uh, we're certainly always uh, willing to assist you and, and help you with any of those uh, production practices or, or ration questions that you may have. Okay, thanks, Justin, very good. Uh, certainly appreciate the discussion. and. We do have a couple of, there are a couple of questions that uh, came into the Q&A box. And the first one, I think, you know, really, as we think about forage quality and 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 maybe some different strategies, maybe in, in which we can manage calves post weaning, you know, I, I'm curious your thoughts with regards to weaning calves on a, and turning them back out on a higher quality forage source, if, if that's available, just depending on what the situation is, in terms of what calf performance could be on a on a lighter weight early wean calf, uh, you know, how, how we might kind of think about that and, and what we might expect to see in that type of a situation. Sure. So, you know, I think that there's a number of different possibilities that can be utilized to, to maintain these uh, calves, certainly post weaning. Uh, now, keep in mind, um, you know, as we increase the production expectations for these calves, obviously, uh, you know, in terms of what our target average daily gain is, we need to certainly make sure that, uh, that any of those higher quality forages that we might have access to just have some realistic expectations. Uh, I do think that grazing programs can certainly be utilized that uh, with, with high quality. Uh, you know, one of the challenges um, that we have seen in, in some of our studies is uh, just turning calves back out into a native range scenario without supplementation. Uh, as those forage quality declines, uh, as we, especially as we get into the fall, the early fall months, uh, really we did not see much additional gain on those calves. And so if it is a higher quality forage that we have access to, uh, and we can certainly, you know, keep the stress on those calves. I think there's, there's certainly an opportunity to, to utilize some of those uh, forage opportunities that, that might be available to producers uh, rather than putting those, those calves just simply in a dry lot. I would encourage producers, though, to, you know, monitor those calves. Uh, that is a stressor, just that maternal separation. And so, you know, maybe a few days to uh, to maybe allow those calves to to get acclimated to that, or at least having the ability to to ride through those calves and and check them and and make sure uh, that we can you know, especially in those first few days after weaning, I think that's really important for us to have that opportunity to to monitor those calves. Oh, very, very good. And one other question that uh, came in here into the Q&A box that I think would kind of tie in to what you just said really well there, Justin, uh, you know, how, what does it mean when you wean a calf or how, how can you define that? And so, 
you know, one, one, I guess, maybe consideration, uh, you know, on, on how you could look at this. And maybe if you're in the situation, as you discussed, if you, you know, can you turn pears back out, uh, you know, onto a forage source, uh, you know, after weaning for a short temporary time and without having, uh, those those calves go back to nursing and, and allowing for that lactation to cease. Does that really help define when when you've got that calf weaned off? Is when we've when we've ceased lactation completely, or is there any certain length of time that we want to consider with that? Uh, well, I I guess I maybe I'm I'm struggling a bit to understand the, the question there, but I think for myself, you know, in terms of how I would define weaning, I I would certainly you know kind of define it as for me that's that's when we've we certainly kind of cease, you know, lactation is, is how I traditionally think of, of weaning there. And if um, maybe I'm not doing a very good job of, of kind of framing or, or answering the question here, but uh, that that's typically what I, you know, tend to think of. I know there's a, you know, producers over the years of, you know, you hear of a lot of different strategies that, that might be employed of, um, uh, of different things that, that could be, um, be done, but typically, you know, I, I think of, you know, weaning is when we've, we've truly got maternal separation and, and we've ceased that lactation from that calf. And, and I don't know, Justin, or uh, Jason, if that came in the chat, if, if we need to reframe that question and do a little bit better job of answering, I, I'm certainly willing to try to do that. No, I, I think that does. I, I think that, I think that certainly does. I appreciate that. We did have another question that came in, uh, Justin. Uh, the question is, if calves are being weaned from different locations, would your priority be to limit the weight variation within the pen or to co or to limit commingling by not sorting and mixing these groups? Okay. You know, that that's really an interesting uh, question. Uh, and, and so I think, uh, you know, obviously, uh, co-mingling could certainly be a concern and you know oftentimes you know if we if we if we if we weren't constrained by by pen space I, I think I would have a preference to at least until those calves had kind of gotten over those initial hurdles uh, so to, to you know I would I would certainly exhibit a preference for uh, uh, maybe keeping those calves especially if they'd come from very diverse locations uh, certainly maybe try to 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 keep them separate based on, you know, different locations. If those herds had, had kind of been made independently of one another, um, you know, in terms of the, the weight variation as well. Uh, obviously, if you could have, you know, two pins per, per location of, you know, kind of the heavy end and the lighter end of the calves, that's probably ideal. Uh, but, you know, realizing that oftentimes we, we start to, to run into some, uh, some limitations there on pen space, but I could certainly, um, I, I could certainly see some consideration, uh, you know, being given to, to calves that had come from different locations or, or different groups of cows, uh, within reason. So obviously we want to try to, you know, our end goal here in everything we do during this, this transition period of weaning is, is really about trying to reduce the stress on those calves. Uh, and so anything we can do to, to kind of offset some of those additional stressors, I, I certainly think that's, that's something we should give some consideration to. Yeah, well, very good. We're not seeing any other questions currently coming into the Q&A box at this point. And so just as a reminder for everyone uh, that this webinar, as well as the previous three that we've recorded, are available uh, to go back and, and view uh, at any time on our K-State Beef Extension website, and that's ksubeef.org. Again, if you just go to the main page uh, of that website and you scroll down uh, down below where the upcoming events are, uh, there's the, the three webinars that we've most recently recorded, as well as this one as well, too, will we'll be up soon, uh, probably within the next day or so, and there'll be additional uh, links out uh, out to those. So uh, feel free to, to go back and, and view that. Uh, view, view those uh, those webinars if there's uh, useful information there. And I guess uh, at the same time too, uh, feel free to reach out to anyone here on the on the KSU beef team as Justin uh, had indicated, uh, if there's any questions or, or anything that we can ever be of assistance with. Uh, if we don't have any other uh, questions coming in here today, I think we can 
go ahead and, and wrap it up. But again, uh, certainly appreciate everyone's time and attendance. Uh, thank you for joining us today and, and uh, hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.